So let me just talk a bit about the mission of LULAC. The mission is to advance the economic condition, educational attainment, political influence, housing, health, and civil rights of Hispanic Americans. Um, our organization has got a very broad mission, and the reason for that is because we are the nation's largest and oldest Hispanic organization, we felt it's important for us to address all the issues that pertain to the economic well-being and health happiness of the Hispanic population here in the country. So that's that's um, a major focus for us. Darrell, are you going to advance the slides for me? Yeah, now? I'll just go ahead and do it for you. Here you go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So about the organization, again, we were created in 1929. We currently have 135,000 volunteer members, which makes this a very unique. Um, these volunteers work incredibly hard across the country, and it's just amazing the amount of time that they put into um, helping their community and making a difference. Um, they're organized into what we call councils. There's over 900 local LULAC councils across the country. Some of those are youth councils, and some of them are the young adult collegiate councils. But um, the majority are adult LULAC councils, and they're in just about every major Hispanic city across the nation. So um, that's really the, the, form, the, the, the base of the organization and where we do a lot of our activity, um, both in advocacy and service programs. We're inclusive of all Hispanic um, ethnic groups. Um, so that's a really um, important uh, focus. We, Cuban American, uh, Central and South American, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, all, all types of nationalities that are part of the organization. And you still hearing me okay, Daryl? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, the organization is headquartered in Washington, D.C. That's where my office is. In fact, um, Cindy Benavides, who you'll hear from later, is in D.C. now. Um, but that's um, where, where we're headquartered. But we also have 17 offices in 10 different states across the country um, where we provide services to the Latino community. In addition, um, through Sarah Jobs for Progress, we have 48 employment training centers. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK. Uh, 28 housing projects. Um, these pr projects are mostly Section 8 housing initiatives that we have. And 55 technology centers. And actually, Daryl, we've grown just since we worked on this uh, slide here, I think we're up to 58 technology centers now. We've just opened up one in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and one in New York City. Wonderful. And then 15, 15 LULAC National Educational Service Centers across the country. So these centers um, are really gearing towards helping um, Latino students stay in school, do really well, and go on to college. And if you look here at this map, this shows um, basically where we've got local LULAC council presence across the country. So. It's a pretty incredible um, operation where we have um, members across the United States. Yeah. So Brent, thank you very much for that overview. Uh, greatly appreciate it. And once again, I know you're in the middle of a ton of things there. So I want to want to personally thank you on behalf of everyone for taking time out to join us today. Next, we're going to move on to listen to a, a couple of individuals that we're very fortunate to have here in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the first is uh, Mr. Eric Straub. He's an immigration attorney, and he serves as our uh, LULAC of Wisconsin Policy Advisor here on the issue of immigration. And then we also have our state legal advisor, Mr. Kane Ulahan, who is, our, um, is also an immigration attorney. So we're very fortunate to have both of them join us today and to give us um, uh, uh, an overview of the new legislation that was just proposed in the Senate. So with that, let me turn it over to, uh, I know it says Kane Ulihan there, but this is actually uh, immigration attorney Eric Straub. Eric, take it away. Hi, um, I'm Eric, uh, attorney Eric Straub, and I want to thank Daryl for giving uh, attorney Ulihan and I the opportunity to, uh, to be here today. Um, I also want to thank uh, LULAC, you know, uh, Attorney Houlihan and I are both members of, uh, of our local council, uh, 326, and um, proud members, uh, but we're, we're happy to be invited, and we want to thank Brent Wilkes and all the work that LULAC has done to really make this Senate bill possible, because quite frankly, you know, immigration attorneys can talk to their blue in the face, but it takes community-based organizations and the people, really, to, to, to convince Congress that, uh, that immigration reform needs to happen. And, and you know, LULAC is just indispensable in that process. So um, thank you, and, and we're privileged to be here as a part of this program. So let's go to the Senate bill. And uh, you know, the first thing I want to do is just remind everybody that it is a bill. It's not law. And so 
you know, unfortunately, any time we see Congress talk about changes in the law or actually have a bill in front of them, what, we, what ends up typically happening is, is that we have a lot of unscrupulous people uh, who come out of the woodwork and, and uh, are willing to offer you know, their services, quote unquote, to unknowing and unsuspecting immigrants um, uh, to file for something. So there's nothing to file for right now. now. That does not prevent you from going and talking to a, an immigration attorney um, who is experienced and finding out about your status right now in anticipation of this potentially passing as long as you understand that there's nothing that you can file at this time. It doesn't prevent you from going to an accredited rep uh, with, the, uh, with the Immigration Service, a community-based organization that has that status and looking into your background and doesn't prevent you from getting your papers in order in preparation for this possibly happening. And certainly if you are eligible for something like DACA, Deferred Action, or if you think you may be eligible for a family-based petition or some other uh, thing in the immigration system, you certainly should come forward and, and talk and get legal assistance now rather than wait. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later and why that's so important. But, um, but you know, what you don't need to be doing is listening to folks like an Atario or, or people that are out there that really don't have the qualifications to uh, render legal advice. And, uh, and are just trying to take your money. So there's, this is just a bill, it's not a law at this point. But that being said, there's a tremendous amount of optimism, I think, that this bill represents a very carefully crafted compromise and represents probably the best legislation that we've seen in over a decade to reform the system. And in addition to that, that we, that we have politically probably the best chance of getting it passed. So uh, what we're gonna do today is it's a monster of a bill. It's over 800 pages, and, and we can't go through every change to our immigration system. Um, but what we're going to focus on is three main areas. We're going to focus on the enforcement components of the bill and, and what that entails, which uh, the slide that you see in front of you right now. We're also going to focus on the legalization program, which is what's going to affect the 10 to 11 million undocumented people or, or more, quite frankly, that are here the most. And then we're going to talk about changes to the family-based system. Again, we, this is not the entire bill. There are also some very important components of it that we're not going to be able to touch today. But for this audience, this is what we felt like you wanted to hear the most about. And, and so that's what we're going to go through. So let's go to the enforcement measures. And, and you know, the Senate first announced this compromise. Um, between the Gang of Eight back in January. And there was a lot of excitement about it, but there was also quite a bit of concern in the media. And one of the areas where there was the most concern, I think, were the triggers in the enforcement provisions that were announced. And so now we finally have seen the language behind those enforcement measures. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of my, my own personal opinion on this in terms of the kind of the hysteria that has surrounded it. I think the enforcement measures and the triggers it is very important for us to keep our eyes on them and make sure that opponents and people that want to kill this bill or want to kill a legalization program don't slip something in or don't uh, use this in a way that defeats the ultimate purpose. But I'm confident after having read the bill and, and seeing what I've seen, uh, a recent visit that I made to Washington, D.C. to talk to my representatives in the state of Wisconsin, I'm confident that it's not the intent of the Gang of AE to have some conspiracy theory to present a legalization program to get it passed and then to, to make it dysfunctional basically by having triggers that don't work. So I don't think you're going to see a system that really gives a jam brewer from Arizona or some other governor from a border state the ability to stop the legalization program. I think what you're seeing is a, a very real concern about security and an attempt to continue to address that along the southern border, primarily. But I think you're also seeing basically a political compromise so that members who have a tough vote to make on this, particularly members from border states who may be critical to this passing or not passing, that they have the ability to go back to their constituents and say that I fought for your interests. We know that there are problems along the border and we know that there are security problems along the border and even though I think most people on this call and, and certainly the people that are, that are doing this presentation believe that we make the border more secure by having this type of reform. 
we can't credibly deny that there aren't security problems. So this, the, the enforcement measures are, are a critical component for politicians to be able to go back and talk to people in those states that are most effective, I think, to ultimately get the votes that we need to get this passed. So we got the triggers that uh, would require certain surveillance and apprehension rates from the Department of Homeland Security and Immigrations and Customs Enforcement before the legalization program could be authorized to give people permanent residence. Now, once the bill is passed, everybody's eligible who's eligible for legalization and they can regularize their status. What the trigger really affects is permanent residence down the road and when they're going to be eligible to do that. So, you know, um, the triggers are not going to stop people from legalizing init initially in, in, um, in temporary status. Um, U.S. companies are going to have to implement E-Verify within five years. And again, this is another one that, that causes a lot of concern over the years. And I would say the reason that E-Verify has caused concern is, is that it was a, there were many attempts in the past by opponents of immigration reform to use E-Verify alone and mandate it on all employers without any reform to the system. And so the thinking was, if we make it impossible, kind of under the self-deportation theory of, of uh, fixing the system, if we make it impossible for people to get jobs, if we make it impossible for employers to give them jobs, they're going to just leave by themselves. I think that has died a very uh, well-deserved death in the last election. And so uh, let's hope that it stays buried. Um, uh, so I don't think that this E-Verify is, is in any way, shape, or form connected to that because it is tied to an overall reform of the system. I think most parties on either side of this debate would, would recognize and, and admit that they don't expect true immigration reform to happen with some ver without some version of E-Verify in place. Um, so uh, are there going to be false positives in the E-Verify system? There probably are going to be. I mean, anytime you take a database that is much smaller right now and expand it to the entire country and all employees and all employers, there are going to be a lot of problems. And those error rates that we've heard about over the years are going to have to be cleaned up. But do we need to fear this? I don't think so, as long as we get the other components of this bill that allow workers to come out of the shadows, it allows families to reunite and to, to legalize their status, and it allows employers to get the workers that they need. And those are three things that I think the bill does a very good job of. And so we need not fear E-Verify, although we do need to be vigilant to make sure that others who are not um, really friends of this bill don't use it as a way to undermine the ultimate purpose. So again, E-Verify, and I, I'm sorry I went on about this, E-Verify is the electronic system, uh, in case for those of you who don't know, that basically requires, uh, it's a voluntary system now, it's mandatory for federal contractors, but uh, an employer can take the social security number usually, put it in the system, and, and almost get an instant uh, you know, verification as to whether that number is good and whether the person that is, that is giving you the number is actually the person that is attached to the number. So it, it's an electronic way to verify status quickly and easily for employers. So it's, it's going to be mandatory under this bill. And lastly, the government is going to implement an entry-exit tracking system at all ports of entry. You know, I think um, uh, this is something that's been promised ever since 9-11, and uh, really the government has consistently fallen short on their ability to, uh, to tell us who's entering and who's exiting, and if people aren't exiting on their visas appropriately, and they're overstaying who they are and where they are, and you know, doing something about it. We've been promised that as a nation since the terrorist attacks in 9-11, and the government has not been able to accomplish it. Well, there's a very simple reason why they haven't been able to accomplish it. It's because there are 10 to 11 million people here, but they have no idea who they are. And, and so, you know, Senator Schumer was very eloquent on this, McCain, uh, Graham. I mean, you're hearing members of the committee, particularly in the wake of the Boston uh, bombings, which were so tragic, step up and say, you know, this is not a reason, the Boston bombings are not a reason to delay immigration reform. In fact, this is precisely why we need immigration reform, because, you know, not that the bombers were uh, undocumented or not that they were foreign terrorists that got in, 
they were actually a U.S. citizen, a permanent resident. But the fact that we have these kind of incidents and we still have 10 to 11 million people that we don't know anything about in this country, their identity, their whereabouts, where they're working or anything, is a security problem. And we're only going to really solve that when we solve the immigration um, uh, reform problem. So um, those are the security enforcement components of the bill. Again, not any real big surprises given the announcements in January. Not anything that I'm overly concerned about, although I, I do encourage people to remain vigilant and make sure that as we go through the amendment process that we don't get poison pills or we don't get things that are going to really gum up the system and ultimately make the legalization system unworkable in practice. So, you know, still reason to be concerned and keep an eye on this. So right now we're going to go to what's going to affect the vast majority of the people that are undocumented in this country, which is the general legalization program that's proposed in the bill. And I'm going to turn it over to Attorney Houlihan, who is going to, uh, to talk about that part of the bill. Great. Great. Thanks a lot, Eric. So I'm getting a little feedback. Do you want to try to... Yeah, I'm trying to use my microphone right now, but it's not seeming to let me. Okay. So um, let's talk about the legalization program. Yeah, and Eric, you may just want to turn down the volume on your laptop. Okay. Here we go. So let's talk about the legalization program that's proposed in the bill. Um, as Eric mentioned, uh, this provision should. Uh, affect and, and, and be available to the majority of the 10 to, a mil 10 to 11 million undocumented immigrants currently in the United States. Uh, the general requirements are pretty straightforward uh, and so as you can see uh, the big one is that it will only be available to those people in the United States on or before December 31st of 2011. Uh, so unless that date changes, if this bill passes, anyone who came after that date would not be uh, eligible for legalization. But uh, as you can imagine, the vast majority of the current undocumented population will have entered prior to that date and will be able to take advantage of legalization. There will be a $500 penalty uh, that's paid at the beginning and, um, and actually a 500 additional penalty at time of adjustment of status to permanent residency, but that won't happen for a number of years. So initially it will just be a $500 penalty as well as some filing fees, which are to be expected in any immigration application. Uh, and then the bill also requires that people who have not filed their taxes pay any back taxes they may owe. So the eligibility requirements, as you can see, are pretty, pretty basic. Um, we're going to then move on to um, the next slide. Could you try to advance it for me? Oh, I'm sorry, Kane. I'll go ahead and uh, give you control. Uh, keep okay, I got it. Yeah. So now uh, that we know who generally will be eligible for the legalization, uh, we would also want to talk about who will not be eligible. So there are some people that may be disqualified from legalization, and uh, in particular it will, it will usually be because of a criminal uh, conviction or convictions. So anyone who has what's called an aggravated felony under immigration law will be ineligible, and that is a, a, a legal term that only really applies in immigration law. And the tricky thing is that there can be some misdemeanors that can actually be aggravated felonies for immigration purposes. So if you have a criminal record, it's vital that you consult with an immigration attorney uh, or accredited representative before you file for any uh, benefit, including a legalization if the bill passes. Uh, the bill also disqualifies anyone for a felony under state law. So uh, a single felony, regardless of what it's for, um, will, will disqualify you under this bill, as will three or more misdemeanor convictions. Um, now, the language of the bill does say three or more misdemeanors that occurred on different dates. So if they occurred on the same date, uh, they will not necessarily disqualify the person if the language uh, in the current proposal stays if the bill passes. 
A person may also be ineligible for certain foreign convictions or a crime that was committed uh, basically in another country. And uh, that's going to depend on what it was and whether that conviction makes a person what's called inadmissible to the United States, which is also a legal term uh, under immigration law, which means basically a reason that you're, uh, you could be denied a benefit or denied entry into this country. So uh, again, if you have a conviction from another country on your record, you're going to want to consult with the, an experienced immigration attorney uh, or, or rep, accredited rep before you go forward with anything. Uh, another uh, disqualifier is if you have unlawfully voted. So um, basically, uh, you know, in the United States, only citizens are, are eligible to vote, and so if someone who is not a citizen voted, uh, that, that would potentially disqualify them from this uh, legalization program. Finally, there are a few other uh, areas of what we call inadmissibility, as I explained before. Uh, for criminal, security, public health, or morality reasons. Uh, so if one of those were to apply, uh, a person could be disqualified. And again, they can be somewhat specific and confusing, so it really is uh, in your best interest to get good legal advice if you think you may have some issue uh, in your past that could affect your, 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 your ability to apply for this program. Um, Moving on, I want to talk to then about the, the benefits of legalization. Uh, what is this program really going to mean for people? Um, at a basic level, the, 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 the legalization gives someone lawful immigration status. It is a status uh, as opposed to, for example, the Deferred Action Program, which right now is not an actual lawful immigration status. It just provides work authorization. RPI, or, or uh, Registered Provisional uh, Immigrant Status, is a legal status. It allows a person to work and travel, uh, and travel would be both inside the U.S. and uh, internationally. Another uh, interesting component of the legalization is that there can be a principal applicant who can then include their spouse and minor children who are present in the United States and who otherwise qualify for legalization. So each member of the family would not have to file a separate application with a separate fee and penalty. One person, sort of like a head of household, could file the application and include his or her spouse and minor children uh, all together in one application, which will, will be uh, a lot easier for families. The RPI status will be good for six years and it will be renewable. And after 10 years in the status, a person will be eligible to apply for permanent residence or a green card. Uh, so there are some concerns that that's a long time to wait, uh, but um, you know, obviously um, the benefits during those 10 years are pretty, pretty, pretty uh, uh, solid. I mean, working and traveling, um, you can pretty much do almost anything a permanent resident could do. So. Um, uh, pretty significant. And finally, once a person has uh, gotten their permanent residence at the end of the 10 years, they'd be eligible for naturalization to U.S. citizenship after just three more years. So we're talking about a 13-year path to citizenship, um, whereas obviously right now many folks have no path at all. So uh, yes, it may be a bit long, but it, it is certainly uh, achievable for, for the vast majority of people that are here undocumented. Quick question, Kane. Uh, I sure. see on the slide right now, the acronym LPR. So when you say permanent residence, is that the same thing? Great question, Daryl. That's a good clarification to make, and I'll just go back. Uh, LPR stands for lawful permanent resident. And very frequently, we just sort of use shorthand and say permanent resident or resident. Um, but yes, that is permanent residence, that's the status that you need in order to move on to U.S. citizenship, and it's also what's commonly known as a green card. Wonderful, thank you. So great, great clarification there. Um, finally, uh, there are two separate tracks uh, within the legalization program that will uh, allow certain groups of immigrants to legalize more quickly and get citizenship more quickly. First is uh, the DREAMers. So the DREAM Act, uh, or components of it, are included in this bill. It will allow uh, young immigrants who were brought to the country under a certain age um, and have met uh, education or military requirements 
apply for permanent resident status after just five years in the provisional status. And then they will be eligible for citizenship immediately after becoming a permanent resident. So we're talking for DREAMers just a five-year track to U.S. citizenship. Um, it's important to point out, too, that uh, under the bill, there is language that says if a, an immigrant has DACA or deferred action for childhood arrival status currently, uh, they would be uh, essentially automatically approved for, for provisional status under the legalization. They would not have to file a separate application. They would just need to have the background checks done again. So they would uh, be fingerprinted. And as long as they didn't have any disqualifying you know, factors such as criminal convictions, they would automatically go into RPI status. Wonderful. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right in again really quick here, Kane. One thing I want to share with everybody on the webinar today is that it is LULAC's official position that if there is somebody who is eligible for DOC or Deferred Action or one of the other programs, that they go ahead and take action to register and start the proceedings today. Reason being is there's still, while well, we have a high sense of confidence that we will get comprehensive immigration reform this year, there are still no guarantees. In addition, we've heard directly from the administration that those who are registered in programs such as Deferred Action or DACA, um, they're going to be put in the front of the line essentially because all of their records will already be in the system and can be processed. As you can imagine, their fear is that if and when this does pass, the system's going to be overwhelmed and it's going to take a while for people to get through. So I just wanted to share that with everybody listening as well. Thanks, Daryl. That's another, that's another great point. So, um, I, you know, I would agree that if, if, if someone is eligible for DACA, Deferred Action, that it's a great idea to go ahead and, and apply and get your work permit and your Social Security number now. And it sounds like uh, if this, this part of the bill survives and it's passed, um, it will be a very quick track to, to becoming a permanent resident. Um, so, uh, so moving on to the second component that, that offers a faster track for the legalization program uh, is the agriculture program, agricultural worker program, which is basically uh, workers that are currently working in the agricultural sector uh, will be eligible to uh, become permanent residents in just five years, like the Dreamers that I just talked about. Uh, the only difference is that they will then have to wait an additional three years to file for U.S. citizenship, so it will be an eight-year track to citizenship for agricultural workers, but still shorter than the general uh, legalization provisions. So uh, the next topic uh, is our changes in family-based immigration, and I'm going to pass it back to Eric. Yeah, so thanks, Kane. Again, um, we uh, fully expect the uh, we fully expect the legalization program to affect a, a huge chunk of people that currently have no options in the system, but uh, no less important in this bill is the, um, the family-based uh, system in terms of the changes, and uh, they're significant. Um, there are also some of the concerns that you hear about this bill um, uh, are a lot of those concerns are directed towards the family-based component in terms of changes. So what we want to do is go through some of the positive changes and also address some of the concerns that people have there about elimination or restriction of certain statuses that are proposed in this, in this compromise by the Senate. The first and, and one of the more significant reforms that the bill proposes to the uh, immigration system in terms of family-based is that Lawful permanent residents um, or permanent residents, green card holders, as we've discussed, will have the ability now to petition for their spouses and children as immediate relatives. And this is very significant. In the past, um, the spouses and, and minor children were not considered immediate relatives. And by immediate relative, that's a very significant term in immigration law. Because if you're an immediate relative, the law says that there is no cap, there is no restriction on the number of visas that can be issued in a particular year, either the total number of visas or by a, a country. And so a lot of these waiting lines that you hear talked about, particularly in the cases of countries like Mexico and the Philippines, those are people in the family-based system 
that are not immediate relatives and are subject to those restrictions in terms of uh, caps on the number of visas that can be issued by country or overall visas per year. And so by taking lawful permanent residents out of that in terms of their spouses and children, it's a big change because it, you know, one, of the, one of the more frustrating things that I've had to do as an immigration attorney over the years is tell a permanent resident who's doing everything the right way and whose family has stayed behind in their home country, um, who, who has finally reached the goal of being a green card holder, that they're going to have to wait another five to six years before they get their, their wife and their, their young kids over here, which, I mean, there's just no justification for that. And, and it's always been a real anomaly in the law and, and an anomaly that just really is, is quite frankly, a tremendous hardship on families. So it's great to see that this is finally being addressed. Um, citizen petitions, and this is one of the more controversial aspects of the bill. Um, in the past, uh, U.S. citizens in the family-based system have been able to apply for their spouses, children, and parents as immediate relatives. And then there's a number of categories, again, where they can petition for family members that have been subject to these overall numerical uh, limitations either based on the overall visa numbers or the particular country that they're applying from. And so one of the categories that is being proposed to be eliminated is the ability of U.S. citizens to file for their siblings, brothers and sisters. And that's what we in the immigration field know as the fourth preference category. Now, um, this is certainly going to get some debate. And, um, you know, I, I know that LULAC has already expressed some concern about it after the announcement in January, and, um, and, and we'll, we'll see what's going to happen. However, I do think people should realize that this is a carefully crafted compromise and that we need to place some context to the elimination of this program. So here are a couple of things that I think people need to keep in mind. Right now, if you are currently in the program, it's not going to be eliminated for 18 months. So if you're close to getting a visa or if you have a number available and you're kind of going through the final stages, it's not going to be implemented for at least 18 months. After five years uh, of, of being in the line, um, you can actually be eligible for what's called a merits-based program that we're going to talk about in a minute. So there are still going to be pathways for people who are in the current system to remain in the system, either, either to have their visas uh, adjudicated in the next 18 months or potentially to pass into or be grandfathered into the merit-based system, which does have family relationships as a part of one of the factors that's considered. Um, so, so folks that are close are, are going to potentially have a, an opportunity to still get a visa this way. The other thing that I would say as an immigration attorney is I have to tell you that fourth preference category is sort of one of the jokes uh, amongst immigration attorneys, and it's, it's not a very funny joke, but the reason that we call it a joke is, is that you know, if you're from Mexico or the Philippines, fourth preference category, the ability of a United States citizen to get a brother or sister over here is essentially non-existent. I mean, you're, you're waiting in line for 20, 25 or more years in many cases. And so, and even with other uh, categories, you know, just generally for all countries, the, you know, we're talking 10 to 12 years in many instances. And so you have to ask yourself, even though this is being eliminated, are we really giving up much um, given what we're getting back? And so I'm not going to answer that question for people out there. Um, this is certainly going to be debated, and it'll probably be one of the more debated parts of the bill. But I just think people should keep in mind that the fourth preference category was one of the most broken parts of the bill. So, you know, keep in mind that what we're giving up was not working very well at all. So, um, so you know, that's just some food for thought. The other part that it eliminates or restricts is married adult children who have United States citizen parents. Their parents can apply for them, um, and this bill actually restricts that to being um, under, uh, you have to be under the age of 31. So again, if you're a United States citizen and um, 
you uh, you have a child who is married and 21 years or older, you're going to only be able to apply for them to get a visa for permanent residence until they are age 31. Once they've turned age 31, you're no longer going to be able to apply for them. Um, again, this is a category that was just hopelessly backed up in, in many instances and practically speaking was not much use for people, particularly from Mexico and the Philippines. So, um, so again, we have to ask ourselves, you know, are we giving away something? Is there a restriction here? There definitely is and it needs to be debated as to whether it's the right change. But what we're giving away was deeply broken and, and was not working for people. So, you know, again, context I think is important in this debate. All right, lastly, the V visa for family members um, is going to be revised. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into the V visa in a lot of uh, intricacy because it's a, it's a rather complicated visa. But here's what I will tell you, that this is meant to address the period of time that people who are abroad who have had family members apply for them, it's, it's, it's to give them some relief. And that's what the VBC used to do. It used to allow certain family members um, to come to the United States and wait if they were in line and the waiting period was very long and they had been waiting for a significant period of time. They were allowed to move here on the VBC and actually live with their loved ones. And so they're going to revive that as sort of a safety valve um, and they're also going to sort of create a new component of it that would allow people to visit for up to 60 days while their petition is pending. So that's a positive development. I mean, you know, the, the, it's, it's good to see the Visa come back. It had a sunset provision on it. It, uh, so, so it, uh, it basically expired and given all the vitriol that we've had over the last six to seven years, there just wasn't the political will to revive it, and it's, it's good to see it revived now. So this merit-based system that we're talking about transitioning to um, after uh, a couple years, and again, this is a point-based system, and sometimes the point-based system has gotten a lot of um, negative feedback in the past when, we've, when it's been discussed, and so again, this will be a vigorous debate, I would expect, in, in, um, in the Senate chamber and in the House when we gets there. But what the Senate is proposing is moving the visa sense system generally so that there's not an employment and family track separately, but that it, everybody's in one track and that basically they're going to get a certain amount of points for these type of factors, education, employment, entrepreneurship, family ties, community service, and other factors. Now, I will say that this is probably one of the scarier part of the bills because we just don't have a system like it. In, in the current immigration system. And, and I think that advocates uh, for the family-based component of the present system are right to be concerned that education, employment, and other factors don't outweigh the family ties in the system. And I, I encourage people, again, to be vigilant and pay attention to this um, because we don't want to see a system where you know, family ties are diminished and only people that we think, quote unquote, have employment experience or, uh, you know, uh, are the higher level of education uh, can get in under, under the merit-based system. Because obviously in countries where there are poverty, in countries where there are not the same opportunities for women, for example, to get the education that men get, we may see some sort of discriminatory effects of the system that we don't anticipate. And so those are concerns that have been raised, and I think they've rightly been raised, and I think we need to make sure that if this merit-based system is going to become a reality, that it, that it be something that does not swallow up and de-minimize the family-based nature of our immigration system. Now, that being said, I think we have to keep an open mind. And, and this, again, is a compromise. It is a system that is based on systems in other countries. That, that have worked in terms of foreign countries that have immigration systems. And, um, and so it's certainly something that needs to be seriously considered, and it is, it is a key component to this bill. There's no question that if this bill passes and this provision passes in it, that this is going to be a part of it, and, and it's going to be a reality in the new system. It's, it's going to be the way the entire system is organized. So it's important. 
It is going to uh, supposedly eliminate the family and employment backlogs by sort of placing everybody into this big system with some of, again, the, the safety valves that I talked about, the family-based changes. And then the petitions that are still pending for five or more years in those current systems are going to, after October 1st of 2014, are going to go into the merit-based system. So really, this represents a very, very significant change in anything we've seen in immigration going back to really the last major change in the system when, when, I, when our current system was kind of born in the 1960s. This is, this is a very, very significant change. Not necessarily something to just be afraid of in and of itself, but something to be uh, vigilant about and careful about in terms of the balance that's going to be struck between these factors. Okay, so I just want to touch on this very briefly um, because, it, it, you know, we're from the state of Wisconsin and this really affects us here, but there is a temporary worker provision in the bill. This is likely to affect a lot of, 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 uh, of the undocumented, well, not necessarily the undocumented, but, but future people who kind of would fit into what uh, the category of folks that are undocumented now. So, in, in other words, how are we going to fix the system so we don't get ourselves in the same place again? And so what they came up with was a guest worker, a temporary work, worker program. And again, W-1 visas are for lesser skilled workers, um, probably hospitality, construction, those type of areas. Um, the W-2 visa is meant specifically for agricultural services. Um, and so that really, really is meant to address um, agriculture. It's, it's critical for us here in Wisconsin because of our dairy industry, which has had no visas available to it ever under the system. And, and, and you know, I, it's estimated that over 60 to 70 percent of our labor on Wisconsin dairy farms, and I think dairy farms across the country, isn't documented at this point. So it's, it's very important for the economic security of my state, and I would argue for agriculture in general and the economic security of, of this country. Uh, uh, to, to stabilize that workforce so we're going to have all our food grown overseas. And then the W-3 visa is an at-will visa um, so that basically if the Department of Labor determines that there is a need in a certain industry, workers from abroad can apply for this um, visa and they're going to be able to come into the United States if it's approved and they're going to be able to move from employer to employer so a real attempt to make this more of a market-based system instead of a system that has caps and is sort of artificially imposed upon the economy. You know, they have just been, uh, you know, business has, has rightly complained that that doesn't work very well for them. And, you know, uh, labor has rightly complained that they don't want people coming in and undermining the wages of U.S. workers. Now, you know, my belief is, is that in most places, particularly in agriculture, that doesn't happen, but it probably does in some industries. So the W-3 visa, I think, responds to both criticisms and strikes a nice balance in that it really allows if the economy is bad and the demand is not there, as the Department of Labor determines it, for the visa numbers to go down or go up if the demand is there for the labor and there are wage protections that were carefully put into place here. It was one of the big issues in the bill between ag producers and, um, and uh, the United Farm Workers Union, as well as the Chamber of Commerce and the AFL-CIO. So I don't think either side got everything that they wanted, but business probably is going to have to deal with wages that are going to be a little bit higher to protect workers, um, and, uh, and labor is going to have to deal with the fact that there are going to be many more visas available for unskilled workers. But the reality is, is that labor has to compete with those folks right now, organized labor does. And in many cases, um, there are plenty of undocumented members of, of labor unions in this country. So, so it sort of just reflects the reality in many ways for labor. So it was good to see both sides come together and compromise on this. And Eric, I have a question. Understanding this is a bill that's over 800 pages long and you just got it and if, if, are, are really now starting to go into the, the deeper reaches of it to understand each and every uh, aspect of it. Do you know for the W-3 visa if there are full labor protections um, for people who have received the W-3 visa? Yeah, I mean with, with all of these W-1, 2, and 3, um, 
anybody that's in this system has access to our, our courts, our laws, and, and you know, part of this compromise was to make sure that that was very, very vigorous. Um, now, you have to strike a balance. I mean, employers and, and farm workers don't want people inspecting their business every week from the government. So, you know, we don't want to put those kind of onerous restrictions. But definitely, uh, my read of the bill thus far is, is that what's in this bill is an improvement um, over, uh, over what we've had in the past. And it's certainly improvement in, in terms of any time you've got somebody who is lawful, they're much less susceptible to abuse and, and they're, 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 they're able to access our legal system and the protections that we provide our workers here in the United States if they're here legally. And that's not any cut on the people that are here undocumented, but we want those people in the system so they can take full advantage. So, so that in and of itself, regularizing them, legalizing them is going to get them more protection than they have currently. But this compromise on temporary workers, definitely uh, the unions were very insistent that there, there be strong labor protections. And I think, you know, they didn't get everything they wanted, but they got more than was on the table in the past. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so I think we, uh, we, we're going to uh, Oops, I skipped a little too far ahead here. So the bill also has some notario provisions, and I'm just going to have Attorney Houlihan go over those real quickly um, because those are, are really new, and, and as immigration attorneys, we're excited about them because we've seen the abuses that notarios have perpetrated over the years. And if you don't mind, Kane, I just want to jump in and make a couple of quick remarks. Um, you know, I've heard this from other uh, LULAC uh, state directors and LULAC members around the country, that unfortunately there is an issue with people who don't have the proper training taking advantage of those um, who are seeking, uh, you know, seeking protection, seeking, um, seeking uh, lawful or advice from people who are trained in this type of thing. And I know here, at least in Wisconsin, we continue to get phone calls from people who fall in victim uh, from these, you know, people who are notarios. That, and that term has a completely different meaning here in the States, as it, as it may be from their country of origin, uh, asking us for assistance in trying to get their, their, their dollars back, et cetera, and, and point them towards credible legal advice. So uh, I just want to point that out to all the LULAC directors, et cetera, around, across the country that... Uh, we have seen a huge issue here, and we, for one, are very grateful that the legislature or the, the Senate was thoughtful enough to include these provisions. So, Great point, Daryl. Yes, thanks, thanks for addressing that. And I mean, what you say is exactly right. This is a huge problem, and I can't tell you how many times Attorney Straub and I have seen, uh, have seen clients come in that have had their cases um, sometimes uh, completely damaged beyond repair, uh, and someone may be stuck abroad and now a family is separated because they got bad advice from someone who took advantage of them because they didn't know uh, and weren't aware that the person was not qualified to give legal advice uh, and, and lost money in the process as well. So uh, this is a huge concern, and so uh, the bill does address it in, in a pretty significant way. Um, what the bill does is, uh, one of the things it does is creates a federal crime for a person to knowingly defraud an immigrant. Uh, and so if a notario or an immigration consultant, someone who is engaged in the unauthorized practice of law, uh, defrauds, or, or it could, I mean, I suppose, apply to an attorney, um, but to defraud an immigrant uh, would be a crime, which is a huge protection for the immigrant community. Um, another uh, component of that new crime would be if someone is to pose as an attorney or a, a accredited representative uh, that would also be a crime. And just to clarify, we have used that term accredited representative before, but just to give a little bit of uh, explanation, the, the BIA that is listed as the Board of Immigration Appeals it is part of the Department of Justice and it, it is sort of the authority on uh, uh, giving this accredited status to, to individuals who have had a certain amount of training in immigration law and are that thus qualified to give uh, assistance with immigration applications, although they're not attorneys. They are allowed by the government to help immigrants with, with the whatever benefit or form they're filing. So um, another component of, of the law would be 
that it would require identification of any person assisting an immigrant with the completion of forms. So this is basically just uh, making sure we know who is, who is helping immigrants file their forms, making sure that it's either an attorney or an accredited representative uh, rather than someone who is an otario. So uh, that, that's another uh, positive development. And then finally, the uh, Attorney General would have injunctive author uh, authority to act against an unscrupulous immigration provider. So essentially, um, any provider, attorney, or otherwise who is acting in an unethical manner could face legal action, legal, legal repercussions, and the Attorney General would have some wide authority to, to take action against those individuals. So uh, this is a very exciting development for the immigrant community. Um, right now, there is, uh, from what I've seen in, in Wisconsin and what I've heard around the country, uh, not a lot of enforcement against these individuals who take advantage of immigrants. And so uh, hopefully these provisions will, will be included if the bill is passed and, and it will go a long way to help uh, protect, protect the immigrant community. I'm going to pass it back to Eric now. I think we're moving on to some final thoughts. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's got to be frustrating uh, for folks that this may affect to say, boy, that sounds great, but there's no bill yet, or there's no law yet, so, you know, why are we even talking about this? And, and you know, uh, hopefully you, you tuned in today and listened to us, and uh, but we want to give you some hope that there's stuff you can do now, and, and one of the things that you can do now is, um, even though there's no law, you can make your voice heard. And it's vitally important, um, uh, you know, as this bill moves, that you do that, that you let your representatives know that it's important, that they need to vote for it, that it's important to the security of this country, that it's important to families in this country, that it's important to the economy of this country. And, and it's, it's humane and it's just, and that, you know, uh, there's a day of reckoning and uh, if they don't get it done, that you might not vote for them, quite frankly, because we've got to push this through. This is our absolute best chance, so it, it's critical that you make your voice heard. Um, another thing that I'd like to say about the bill is, you know, and, and I'm going to confess from the immigration community, I have heard a lot of talk in the last months, and especially in the last weeks as this, as this bill was introduced, about, well, we don't like this, and we don't like that, and we would like to see something else in it. And, you know, I just want to remind people, uh, and I think, uh, you know, we got to put this in context. So even though some of this has been my own opinion today, it, it's really to provide some context as an immigration attorney that, um, you know, some of these things that are in here, practically speaking, aren't as scary as you might hear in terms of the rhetoric that's out there right now. And I think John McCain said it best the other day when, when they had the news conference. He said, the perfect must not be the enemy of the good. So we will never get a perfect bill. Immigration attorneys will never get the perfect bill that they want. Because let me tell you, if we wrote it, it would be 5,000 pages and you, you'd all go crazy. Um, uh, so, so you know, LULAC will never get the perfect bill that it wants. Uh, thank God Chris Kobach and the people from Arizona behind that law won't get the perfect bill that they want. Nobody's going to get everything they want. Um, but to me, this represents a very good compromise. Do we still need to try to make it better? Absolutely. Do we still need to be very vigilant that we don't let people who are really the enemies of this bill that might not you know, might be pretending like they're not the enemies of this bill, that we don't let them kill it, or if we don't let them put something in it that's going to make it ineffective and accomplish their purposes, we absolutely do need to be vigilant. But let's not be inflexible, because none of us are going to get everything that we want, and this represents, in my opinion, a very good compromise. All right, some practical stuff. If you are eligible now, do not wait. Daryl already talked about this. I'm not going to belabor it, but you know, uh, we've got an estimated two million kids that are eligible for DACA. They say the estimates are that at least one million of those kids are eligible right now. We only have half a million of them that have filed for deferred action, and um, you know that is the wrong choice in my opinion. Uh, you need to 
attorney, you need to make sure that you're eligible and that you have a, a good chance to succeed, uh, you know, given your background and everything. But if you're eligible, you need to file now because as you've heard today, uh, whether it's deferred action or whether it's the family-based system, if you're already in the system, there are advantages to you being in the system um, that are written into this law that are going to make it faster and cheaper uh, and easier for you to ultimately get permanent residence and citizenship. So don't wait. Another reason not to wait is, I got to tell you folks, there are, there are about 12,000 immigration attorneys in the entire United States of America that are members of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Uh, this is a small group of specialists. You're going to be overwhelmed by this bill if it passes like we have never been overwhelmed in our history. The government is going to be overwhelmed by this many people going into the system in a way that they've never been overwhelmed before. So get ready now um, if you think that you're eligible for something. It, it, you know, don't let somebody talk you into filing for something or paying a lot of money for something that hasn't passed as a law. But there's nothing wrong with you going in and paying a reasonable amount to an attorney or going to a community-based organization that can start to help you organize things to get ready now because the people that are the best prepared now before this passes are the people that are going to get it done the quickest and the easiest in my opinion. That's just kind of the way life and the government and the law works. So don't wait. Lastly, um, uh, get good legal assistance. We've talked about that. I know a lot of people say it's in my own self-interest and I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't, but I firmly believe in it. Uh, you know, I've, I've spent many and I'm tired of hearing the stories of people who go out there to attorneys who don't really have immigration experience or to notarios who are not attorneys at all and don't have any legal experience and they get uh, their cases damaged beyond repair and you know there, there's a saying in life sometimes you only get one chance to fix something and this may be the one chance that people get to fix their status so do it right do it right and do it smart. So uh, that's really what we have to tell you today. Uh, other than, to, uh, you know, on behalf of uh, Attorney Houlihan and myself, we'd like to thank Lulac, Daryl Maureen, Brent Wilkes, and, and uh, you know, everybody out there for inviting us to do this. And just to tell you how excited and optimistic we are that we can push this through and we can affect the lives of, of millions of people in the process. So thank you very much. Yeah. Well, let me just say on behalf of LULAC, particularly LULAC of Wisconsin, Eric, how much we appreciate all of your assistance as our um, immigration uh, policy advisor here to LULAC of Wisconsin and Kane, uh, you as well for serving as our legal advisor. So thank you both very much for taking the time out to create the presentation, to share it with all of us here nationwide, and actually some people joining us from from outside the U.S. as well. And now we're going to turn it over to Cindy Benavides, who is our Director of Civic Engagement and Mobilization. So, Cindy, take it away. Great. Thank you, Daryl. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, and if it's possible to click to the next slide in terms of ways to get involved. Wonderful. Um, so first, thank you so much to everyone that has been on the call. Uh, we know that it's a Saturday. In some places it may be sunny, in some places it may be raining. So we thank your dedication for being um, on this call and really trying to get more information on, on what's going on in terms of immigration. So just in, in terms of, you know, why get involved? So first, we have to keep the pressure on. We realize that this is not a perfect bill, but it's a very good beginning. And we want to make sure that this bill continues on the path um, to actually happening. Things that you can do directly uh, to impact this bill, first and foremost, call your federal elected representatives. It's so important that your members of Congress hear from you in support of this immigration bill. Um, if you can, please. Call your two senators, and and you know once we have a bill in the House, you know we can go ahead and keep the pressure there. But you can go ahead and still call them now and and, and express your voice. And the the reason why this is so important is because we know that folks from the other side, folks that are not supporting immigration reform, are already doing this. And when we go on the Hill, we hear a lot of what's happening on the other side. So we want to make sure to keep the pressure on that our members of Congress who are public servants who represent us, understand that this is important for us. So that's the very, very first thing. 
Um, second, sign our I Voted for Immigration Reform petition. You can find that on the LULAC website, and it's www.lulac.org. Um, the petition basically allows us to send a postcard on your behalf to your members of Congress, and that's your two senators and your district representative. The third thing, uh, LULAC is part of the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda. And through NHLA, we have formed Latinos United for Immigration Reform. So if you visit latinosunited.org, you are able to email your members of Congress and also email the President and Vice President in support of immigration reform. Again, our focus is uh, on the members of Congress because this is right now in the Senate, so we want to make sure that they understand that this is, a, this is important to us. And let me just be clear, it's, it's important that you do it no matter what state or what district you live in. Um, we realize that you know, we have uh, districts that are not fully supportive of immigration reform, but I think the more that they hear from you, um, the better it is for us in terms of making the case of why this is so important. And oftentimes what we hear from the members of Congress is that the best advocates in terms of, of getting the support for immigration reform are the constituents. So your voice is extremely important in this debate. Please, please uh, contact your members of Congress, and you can do it online at latinosunited.org. And let me just make a brief pause. So in terms of latinosunited.org, you don't have to actually go online to do it. You can do it from your smartphone. And it's super easy. It takes about three to five minutes to do it. Um, there will be a uh, pre-filled out form. And you can actually change it so that it expresses your point of view and you can incorporate changes into it. You can also spread the word. So we know that all of you have amazing networks, whether it's your friends and family, whether it's your organization, CBOs, online, all those networks that definitely make sure, uh, that make us uh, get more folks involved in this debate. Please spread the word. Uh, let them know what they can do. The very first thing is contacting their members of Congress, and we cannot stress that even more. Um, and then lastly, as part of Latinos United, LULAC is hosting many, many town halls across the country. Uh, many of you heard from our uh, executive director, Brent Wilkes, earlier in the presentation. And he's right now in Texas spearheading three town halls that are happening across the state of Texas this weekend. Um, so if you can, please host a town hall and or contact LULAC to get involved. Um, at the Latinos United website, there under Act Now, you are able to see a map that lets you know where the town halls are happening. Um, so you are always welcome to go to latinosunited.org and find out more information. And obviously, we're part of that effort as well as lulac.org. And then uh, Daryl touched upon volunteering. We're so excited that many of you have already posed a question in, in terms of how you can get involved. Uh, we welcome all volunteers and, and definitely look forward to working with you in the future. Daryl? Yeah, so once again, just to reiterate, if you go to lulac.org, www.lulac.org, um, you're going to find a lot of information on LULAC and the history-making initiatives we've had since our inception in 1929. The toolkit, very easy to use. You can print out everything from banners to getting copies of um, different position papers, etc. It's just Cindy and her whole team at the National Office have just done an outstanding job. And once again, we ask that everyone take three to five minutes to go to latinosunitas.united.org. Uh, and, and fill out that form, and we'll take, uh, we'll take on the burden of getting your message out uh, to the president, the vice president, and, and your representatives and senators. Just a wonderful great. opportunity. Just, great. Thank you, Darren. And just to add, in terms of the immigration toolkit, this is something that I almost feel it's, it's my baby. Um, it's a baby of LULAC. It's something that, in, in terms of what we were thinking and what we were hearing from the community, from organizers, from leaders and organizations, um, they, they basically posed a question in terms of how we could make it easier uh, for them to organize different events, whether it was town halls, whether it was in-district meetings with the members of Congress, whether it was phone banks. So this toolkit provides a lot of resources from talking points to a PowerPoint to flyers that you can customize to just different checklists and, and things that you can utilize as you organize in your community on immigration, so please, please go to lulac.org slash toolkit, and this is a downloadable toolkit, so you're able to tweak it to, to fit your needs in the community. 
And once again, like Daryl mentioned, please do go to latinosunited.org and send a, member to, uh, send a message to your member of Congress. Daryl? Well, with that being said, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to everybody, for our members, for those visiting from around the country and, and out of the country for taking time out to, to join us for this very important webinar and information that um, obviously we know it has social and moral implications, but it also has some very important commercial uh, and, and uh, economic um, implications as well. So I want to take one last moment to thank all of you for joining us. If you'd like more information on LULAC or the different initiatives who are running in so many states or across the country and are interested in participating, please once again feel free to visit us at www.lulac.org or give us a call. And I'm going to give you a secret, our secret 800 number. It's actually 877-LULAC-01. So you don't even have to pay for the call. Thank you all once again. Uh, as I mentioned, it's our intention to have this up on the website within about a week or so. And once again, my apologies for some of the technical difficulties we had. But thank you once again. Have a wonderful weekend.